entertainment and uh, other activities that we could do. So Don's going to walk you through this, I believe. I am. Yes, you were. Uh, I did not do this. Thank you. Uh, I can't. I got the clicker. What about what? Oh, Western. Western Day. Oh, Western Day. Oh, Western Day. I already put that right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay. I was like, are we at the entertainment district? <laughs> yeah, James, James will do Western Day. Only five slides. Um, again, just a quick recap of 2011 so you know where we are at this point. Uh, Western Day, by the way, uh, at least 1964. It could have been older than that. The oldest reference we found in any newspaper is 1964. So you're talking an event now that's closing in on 50 years uh, in a lot of different forms. Uh, last year, attendance 24,630. That's the most since uh, since the event came back in 2004. City revenue, 82,002. That's the most that we've gotten in the year that we've run the event. Uh, total expenses, 407,000. That's the most we've spent on any year on an event. You see all the numbers go up together. Uh, just a reminder, none of that is out of the general funds. No property tax money here. It's hotel fund is the bulk of it, donation fund which includes event revenue from past years, and risk funds just for the parade. Uh, our headliner was Pat Green. Our Friday headliner was Josh Abbott. We brought in two new activities this year. One was everything around the MCL brand, uh, picking that off, and the other was the cooking demonstrations that you heard mentioned earlier. And um, you see a lot of potential in both of those areas. So just a quick recap, last year, successful year. A lot of things went well, a few things we can still do better. And uh, we still continue to grow this event to the signature festival that council has said you want. Here's some opportunities you see for 2012. Um, we've talked to the promoter line. I think probably most of you, maybe all of you, have met Jerry Thompson at some point. He's our, uh, our uh, consultant that works on festivals. He does a, works with a lot of the major festivals in the Metroplex. And he's saying that if we want to continue to grow the event, especially in terms of attendance and revenue, that the best way to do that is to expand your entertainment uh, especially bigger name headliners or uh, just upping your, your game on the entertainment. And to make sure that you take full advantage of every available space within your festival zone. You don't have dead zones, which uh, we've occasionally dealt with in the past. Uh, we've identified some opportunities. All of them have some level of budget impact because when you add to an event, you have to pay for it somehow. Uh, series of opportunities. One is to boost the entertainment. Uh, last year we had Pat Green, great performer. Big, big crowd on Saturday night, and that helped to, uh, to contribute to those attendance and revenue numbers. Um, possibility of a boat show, um, and we'll possibly only during the day on Saturday, possibly throughout, uh, but we've got multiple boat dealers in town uh, along 35, uh, chatting with them and seeing if they have any interest in bringing three or four of their boats up, setting them up in an area up here on Main Street, right outside this window, in fact, and then they can have somebody standing there on site to talk to people as long as they're not strong-arming them. I suggest we get a commission on these sales. I was told that might not be allowed. But uh, I'm going to keep trying that angle. But a boat show, and also a tie into the lake. We've never been successful to tie Western Days into the lake. Uh, we tried a couple of years when there was the Big Bass Tournament up there. The uh, Texas the Lone Star Classics Big Bass. Just didn't quite work. Uh, larger kids area. Kids area is a revenue generator for us, and we're not anywhere close to tapping the potential. Uh, Plano, that is the, one of their largest revenue generators for the Balloon Festival, but they have twice the space. So we would look at using still the grassy lot across church, but also the uh, parking lot on the west side of City Hall. Um, scattering the food vendors throughout the festival zone. Logically, you think have a food court, everybody knows to go there. But the festival zone is so big that when somebody is over in the corner of Main and Mill and they want food, they don't feel like walking all the way over there. And uh, so scattering them around the zone helps to boost your sales for all the vendors. It also increased your cost because they all have to have electricity. And right now, there are areas in the festival where we do not put generators. Those generators are the big ones. They're $3,500, no, $4,500 for those generators. So there is a cost involved there. Uh, making better use of this building. Uh, we, we did some good things here. The people that came in liked it. It was just a matter of drawing them in. Uh, we didn't use the courtyard well. We think the courtyard could be an, another station. Have some entertainment in there, move a stage into the courtyard. Uh, set up a bar as a cantina area, maybe even a wine tasting. There's been talk in council before about doing a wine tasting similar to Grapevine. Uh, we wouldn't maybe do it to the scale they do, but uh, at least at first. But that's something we could do possibly in the courtyard. Um, improve our audience experience at the main stage by having additional lighting. Uh, it, it gets pretty dark in front of the stage. And um, so some kind of lighting just for security, but also for ambiance. 
Uh, and then the possibility of a second jumbotron, the one by the stage is great. Uh, you can see it right there. The one a little bit farther off for people who can't get very close to the stage might also add to that audience experience. And then also improve the atmosphere for our sponsor hospitality area. We've got some great sponsors, and they come out and the, the, this year, the hospitality area was on the third floor of City Hall, and the people that came in there loved it. Uh, G Texas, our caterer today, was a caterer for that, uh, sponsored that, in fact. Gillies was our sponsor. Um, but we think there's more we can do up there, including um, having a screen and, and audio in there, so while they're sitting there having dinner on Saturday night, if they want to watch the main stage performer on a video screen while eating, they can do that. We didn't offer that this year. Uh, there's some cost in that. It's a pretty good distance to run the wiring or the microwave one. So those are the opportunities we see. We didn't give you itemized costs. There's a lot of moving targets. The boat show, for example, if it, the boat show is at night, we have to have a generator and lights. And if it's during the day, that cost goes away. What we're looking at is where there's potential funding to be identified. One is that uh, in the Community Activities Fund, uh, which is the old donations fund, we've changed that to a budgeted fund, and that's where our sponsorship money goes, that's where event revenue goes. Um, Nika's still back there. When Nika gets the agreements with our ED partners and they put in community support money, that's where it goes. And uh, Nika had set aside some money for an event for this year that it turns out she's not going to have. So there is money. It says $25,000 for the headliner. Uh, that kind of jumps ahead to a piece of paper and you get in a minute. So ignore the for the headliner part. But there's $25,000 available right now. We just have to just change how it's allocated, but it's, it's already been budgeted. Um, in addition, in our budget, we set up uh, for this year, we projected $52,000 in event revenue. You saw earlier, we actually brought in $82,000. So there's another $30,000 we brought in at Western Days last year that we could use for this year's Western Days, but right now it's in the reserve. It's in the, uh, the fund balance for this fund. That would require a council appropriation. So if that's the direction you want us to go, we would come to you for that appropriation. That would create $55,000 additional funding we could dedicate to the 407000 we spent this year. With that, we could get pretty far on that list of activities. Maybe not get everything exactly the way we want it, but we could get pretty far on that list uh, if you're interested in those activities. Uh, just so you know, uh, this year, revenue versus budget, uh, there's 129000 in projected hot revenue that we did not budget. So um, we're okay on the hot fund. Uh, we're not pushing our limits there. Uh, we are going to make an increased effort again this year for sponsorships. We brought in some new sponsors last year. We're going to push it really hard this year again. And that could help offset some costs as well because that sponsorship money will feed right into the event. Uh, so if we are successful at effort, and I believe we will be, that can help offset or expand as well. I think that's my only other slide. That's it. So I guess what we're looking for here is just direction of do you want to expand the event budget using these available funds and certainly we would accept input from council on some of those opportunities if you had some some thoughts to share. I have already secured the event or sponsorship again for the uh, uh, cooking cooking demos. Sorry, those all were all very well received. Those were well received, and in fact, uh, John Gilbert with G Texas. Well, they changed their name. The, the, the caterer here in Gillies, uh, the sponsor last year, uh, he provided the person that ran the cooking area and coordinated that. He has very good connections with one of the morning shows in town. Uh, that he's, he, he's done cooking demonstrations on that morning show. He believes it would bring this back. He's got a good shot at getting on the morning show sometime in the week or two prior to Western Day. So we can get some real good marketing out of that. And uh, as, as the mayor mentioned, uh, we do have sponsors I don't they haven't signed any paperwork, but there's verbal commitments, and we'll get that. I have a couple of thoughts on it. Um, one, and I actually shared this with James a little while ago, um, the Masons in Fort Worth actually brought in a competition chuck wagon. Group. They had about 16 different chuck wagons. This was a few years back. They did it as a fundraiser for the orphanage that they had down there. But these guys were as authentic as the day is long, and bought tickets to eat. Um, and you could buy like a buffet ticket where if you bought the big ticket to eat at several, then you could judge. And you got they had they had a whole judging thing. And I'm, I can't think of anything more Western days than chug wagon. Um, might be an idea. Might be able to leverage that whole food thing that we. Where did they do that? What do you mean? 
Um, there's the there's the Scottish Rite. They've got a, that big. It's either orphanage or senior care home oh, down they on the south. Yeah, they yeah. did it on their facilities, but but they, they brought in a team. There's these competition teams. They travel right. all over the country. Right. Um, so that'd be one. The other the other is um, you know the wine tasting school. And that's kind of a neat thing. But I also think grapevine when I think that. Why not a beer tasting? Why not a uh, uh, moonshine or local <laughs> liquors? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just thinking outside the box. It, it, no moonshine. You know. It, you don't, you don't want, you don't want to be well, yeah, well, fine, fine. But why not a beer tasting? Well, you know. We actually looked at that and we thought it was a great idea too. But the, the laws are different in relation to beer tasting and wine tasting, and it's just not possible. Jerry's actually researched that for us. Really? Yes. It was surprising well, to me also. It, it's possible, but it's like a ton more interest. You can do a wine tasting basically, basically nothing, where beer you've got to pay a lot of money because the way PABC sets up their law, if you're a winery only, not distributing beer, that's one license. If, if an example is there's a, there's a place in downtown Grapevine, that they call themselves a winery, and all they serve is wine, no other alcohol, period. And they don't have to operate under the same license the guy next door to them that sells beer and wine. Totally different. It's bizarre. It's, it's, it's we we love the I think I think we need to fight for a beer tasting. <laughs> <laughs> the difference that you're talking about goes back to when the wine industry was first trying to get established, actually out in the Lubbock area. And the legislature thought that was a great idea, yeah. and the wine industry said, well, if you want us to do this, you're going to have to loosen your, regu your regulations, or we can't do it. So they pretty much eliminated a lot of the regulations. And so, yes, wine is uh, not free and loose, but wine is a lot easier to deal with than beer in Texas. And then, well, alcohol, you know, hard liquor is even harder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, I threw that one out there because there's lots of microbreweries for whiskey and moonshine, and, and it's become quite the cottage industry here in Texas. I'm not kidding. Where's that? I'm not kidding. But there's cottage industry in Texas that is developing a lot of these things, and we can promote local Texas. Yes, it is legal. It is absolutely legal. <laughs> we, do, we do revisit that beer tasting literally every year. We go back and say, has it gotten any better? And we just haven't gotten any progress. We will revisit that again. The two vendors that we use, they both say that we'd love to do it, but it's going to be a big deal. We need to get some people in the state ledge to help us out, huh? Yeah. If I can, just to mention how liberal, I guess, the wine lobbyists have made things for that type of um, alcoholic beverage, they can literally leave. This is per G Texas, our. Um, Sessionaire, they can literally leave our festival if we so chose with a bottle of wine. However, they well, can right. However, the mayor knows. However, they cannot do that with beer. Correct. It's because of the, the lobbyists. And that's been in law for some ten years. It's called you cork it, you take it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you cork it. Wine and champagne, you cork it. You trust the official name. But that's what called, yeah. so that I'll remember that. Restaurants, that. <laughs> restaurants in Texas have to learn that. That's state law. So we get beer with a higher alcohol. I just had some comments on some of the things you have up there from my own perspective and, and plenty of years coming to Western Days. Uh, the clustered, uh, well, going back to the, the food vendors, having them all in one area I think is, is a bad design. Right. Um, I know that I, there were several times that I was on the opposite side of where I wanted to be if I wanted something. And, and so uh, what I would add to that is that you talked about the cost of the generators, um, that, and maybe this is your intent anyway, but it seems to me that having several small food villages would make a lot more sense where they can share a generator. There's three or four vendors in that area. And I'm not sure you won't find that you get back uh, at least part of the cost of that because you'll get more spontaneous sales. People walking by will go, yeah, you know, I think I'll have another beer. Or, you know, let's get a pretzel or something. Uh, whereas now, you, you've got a trek over there to eat, so I think that's a good that's what point. That's what he's proposing. That's what right Jerry has told us. And that's one of the items on here, by the way. Both of these here, the kids' area and the food vendors, both of those have positive revenue impact that's not reflected at this point. But some of our expenses will be offset by the fact that we'll make more money. Well, on the other hand, with the boats, I would say do that in the daytime and not spend the money for generators. I'm not sure how much activity you'll get on 
on that evening anyway. So like that's, that's our piece. proposal, unless the boat leaders say we have to be there at night for some bizarre reason. Okay. That's our proposal, partly because if you've been here, after dark, yeah, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, when it gets dark, the vast majority of the crowd is there for the concert. Yeah. And the boat area being here, we think, would become a dead zone. I think uh, so I think the boat vendors will say exactly what you're saying. We just haven't talked to them. Uh, the courtyard surprised me last year because um, you almost couldn't tell whether there was anything going on in the courtyard unless you walked up nearly to the doors. And uh, so I thought I was surprised that we weren't making you know, it was, it was a ready-made space, it's concrete, I mean, I was surprised we were making better use of that. So, uh, it, it, there's got to be something we can do with that. That's and that's what I plan on. Actually, one of the, the more affordable items on the list. Because we already own a stage, and so we already pay for the generator and sound and lights. And you take this minute for us. Yes. Oh, good. They are, by the way, the alcohol vendor for the entire festival as part of their concessions contract. So uh, that's why we refer to them quite often, talking about the wine and beer, G Texas, or whatever their name is now. That, now, they have the same name, but they've broken out their alcohol to a separate company. But nevertheless, it's the same vendor that does that. Do we give a different rate? Do we give a different rate for Louisville businesses versus businesses from out of town set up with Louisville? We do not. Uh, the way right now it is set up on our vendor fees, we have a nonprofit rate, which is the lowest, and then we have our business rate, which is based on the size of the, of the space, 10 by 10, 10 by 20, 10 by 30. And then food vendors are higher than that and also have a commission paid. So, but we do not at this point have a discount for Louisville businesses. I just like to try to promote, you know, we have, what, 800, how many businesses do we have? In About 2,000, I think. Yeah, it's like, I think about 800 members of the, that are members of the chamber, yes. and then there's almost 3,000 or 3,300 individual businesses, whatever. I should just like to get you know, the rules of businesses, try to spur them on to be part of it. And, and I agree with that. The only thing that, that, that I know is, and I, I, I want to support it too, it's like we do our people play golf and do a discount. But, make the, if you go to all these really successful venues, they have vendors that come from other parts of the country that people don't ever see them, and that's what brings the crowd out. It's like, oh, wow, you've got people from Virginia, from here, but we don't have that yet. Don't get me wrong, we don't have it yet. But I, I don't have a problem with that, but we don't want to scare off any other vendors that we have. I agree. I agree with that. I just would like to do something, maybe not a discount, but maybe some Market has been, come on, you're here in Louisville, come. One thing we Jackson, do. I, oh. I think you're about to say what I was about to say. Jackson right. and I have talked about uh, local businesses getting the, uh, the cheaper rate for the. One thing that we're looking at, well, there's kind of three different points there. One is we, we noticed last year that the businesses in the festival zone that were most successful that day were the ones that took advantage of the free space they have in front of their front doors. Beasley's put clothing racks out front, and uh, Lisa Doubley told me that was the best day she's had. She, she sold great. Um, the complete interior solutions fenced off the front of their space and put out chairs, and they had a big day. So the businesses in the zone can use the sidewalk space in front of their business, as long as people can still get by, and there's no car charge for them for that. That's good. Now, we are talking, uh, I spoke with Amanda, we're going to talk some more to see how we might be able to flesh this out. Businesses that are in the festival zone, yeah, we're bringing in 25,000 people, but there's also negative impacts on them, and we understand that. We're bringing competition in, they're having some inconveniences, and some of the regular customers might stay away for a day or two. So we're talking about the possibility of businesses that their main entrance is inside the festival zone, offering them the nonprofit rate. Uh, we can't really do it for free because they're using city property to make profit, but to offer them the nonprofit, which is the lowest rate we offer, so that if Bill, for some reason, wanted to have a tent out in the festival zone in addition to his office, he could do that at the lowest possible rate. And we're trying to work out the details on that. And in terms of local businesses, the one concession that we do make for local businesses is food vendors. Food vendors are special because you don't want to have so many food vendors that none of them make any money. There's a certain number of food vendors you can have based on the crowd. And that number keeps growing, but it's limited. And especially, you don't want to have 15 food vendors all selling kettle corn because then they're all going to be mad because they're all going to have leftover kettle corn. Um, so we limit how many food vendors we have and how many of each type. 
what we do for local food vendors, the ones that are you know, Louisville or pretty much adjacent to Louisville, they get, uh, I think it's an extra 30 days or 60 days. We send them the application 30 days before we send it to anybody else. So they get 30 days that they can sign up and they are in, and then everybody else waits until the regular time. So Louisville vendors, you're saying they get first dibs? For food vendors, yes, because space is limited for them. Oh, we, we can do it for other vendors. There's no no limit on how many we'll have. But yeah, maybe the, they'll think it's exclusive. Yeah, I like there. the idea that the people on the zone there have their front sidewalk, you know, and I'm glad we didn't keep up the music. Yeah, so I'm glad we didn't keep up the music. Did you have anything on that, too? Y'all don't put that on the part. No, I think you addressed the main, one of the main concerns was just uh, some of the businesses down there that have other business tents right in front of. I have the luxury of the cushion because mine kind of kicks out and I have the bench and I have space there. Some of them don't and the tents are pushed right up to that sidewalk right in front of their business um, where they've lost, you know, business for the day or nobody really steps out on that back because we're looking at the back side of the tents. So they had inquired about getting the space right in front of their business. But then, you know, it's an expense to them to you know, have to pay for a tent that day. So that's kind of the compromise that we came up with. They just kind of great to have a tent basically to extend their storefront and not be covered up by somebody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. We just bring that back to the people. Okay. Yeah, you could do that. That could be a possibility. I like it. Anything else? Oh, um, there's two pieces of paper. Um, that I forgot Jennifer had. One is a list of showing the headliners that we've had the past five or six years and what we've paid them. You'll see the growth there. And the other is a list of acts that are available for this year uh, and what their cost would be. This is just their base cost. All of them have little riders that are additional. You know, they want food for the band or they want, you know, certain uh, sound or equipment that does have a cost. Um, but nevertheless, this shows you where we've been previously. It's interesting, uh, Eli Young is available for this year at $125,000, uh, which is $35,000 more than we paid Pat Green last year, and it's $100,000 more than we paid Eli Young four years ago. <laughs> They've gotten popular. Um, actually, our, our recommendation is one that Jerry came up with. There's a two-for-one deal where you can get Josh Abbott on Saturday and Randy Rogers on Friday for a combined $150,000 which would be a slight increase in what we paid this year, but not dramatic. And those are two bands that he says would draw extremely well. He still says Eli Young would draw better than them, but he acknowledges that these two, that's a good deal. Well, I, my thought would be, you know, my thought would be just let the promoter decide what they have. We give him the budget, which you've kind of done here, and let him decide which band he thinks would be best for them. That would be good, Mayor. We need to move on that pretty quickly. If the council would give us that authorization, that's something we need to build probably within the next two or three weeks. No idea. Everybody okay for doing that? Everybody okay for doing that? Yeah, what's that? We give them the budget, which he's already mm -hmm. out of my chair doing those two things there. And those two things. Plus any additional funds that we could get from event sponsors, which we think we'll have to get some more last year and hopefully we'll get some more this year. So we add that, those two things there to the budget. We give him the budget. Money for the budget to tell him which band to pick the bus kind of pick the thing. I mean, what you and I want might, might not be what's the twenty five thousand people want. What's Glenn Miller good for anymore? <laughs> I mean, I like it. You got a backup? <laughs> I, I told him I wanted uh, I wanted uh, uh, the problem is you can't get Glenn Miller live. <laughs> yes. he, he said get back up. I suggested Faye. Yes, yes. That's okay with that? I have no idea. Is there any of these bands ever since? And again, the best thing is it's not general fund money. It's uh, revenue from the event and sponsor money. Right. Okay, so what you say is we need to get, because if he's going to book these acts, he's got to book them. So if I'm hearing you, we can go ahead and say, if somebody want to make motions to make these appropriations to the, uh, the proposed appropriations to the budget for West Week, and then uh, have the event coordinator decide which band he feels would be uh, best for the event. I move we appropriate the uh, the funds as listed on the slide presented. Uh, I second. Uh, 
second that. Have a motion by Councilman Gilmore. Do we get that? I got it. Okay, and a second by Councilman Bond. Any discussion? No, we're missing a member. No, he's right, right. He's right there. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, and then about the choosing the. Uh, we move, I move we allow the, uh, the promoter to go ahead and pick the band. Okay. Uh, a motion by Councilman Gilmore. Second. Second by Councilman Durham. All in favor? Is that, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Is that for both days? So yeah. I'll, I'll get, uh, I can make that amended motion if you'd like for both days. Please do. Okay. You second that, Hillary? Yes. Okay. Uh, motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah. Motion carried. Okay. Just to recap, what do we, what's the total we're budgeting for the 140? Adding additional? You're adding 55. You're adding 55. 155. Total, no. No, no. 55. Just adding 55. Just adding so the total we've been budgeting. It was 30,000, it was additional, it was revenue from last year's video, 30,000 revenues from last year's event, and then 25,000 from our event fund. Okay. That's not what I said. The total is over 400,000. 